Welcome to the Knife Magazine YouTube channel. The following video relates to a video posted by the Antique Bowie Knife channel, which was taken at the December 2021 annual meeting of the Antique Bowie Knife Association in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, the Antique Bowie Knife channel filmed several videos at that event uh, of different collectors and different collections, and one in particular was taken of some knives in my collection, and uh, we had a lot of feedback on that particular video and of one particular knife in that video, th this one right here. And as a result of all those questions, I would like to discuss that knife a little more and so that people can understand its history and perhaps some of you out there can help answer some of the questions that are unanswered about this knife. So let's talk about this knife. This is a, a guardless coffin Bowie knife mounted in silver, and uh, made in America, probably the Deep South, uh, somewhere in the 1830s or perhaps very early 1840s. Uh, the knife itself is about 9 and 3 eighths long overall with a 5 and 3 eighths inch blade and is one of the, the finest made Bowie knives I have ever been able to examine. A, a, a very complex knife with incredible fit and finish, a really difficult knife to make. Though made uh, on the edge of the frontier in the 1830s or possibly the early 1840s, it easily meets my standard of uh, an antique knife made by a maker who could walk into a custom knife today and spread his wares out on the table and they wouldn't look out of place. A very finely made knife, even though it was made potentially 190 years ago. This knife, believe it or not, was purchased on eBay, and, and the silver mounts had been left to tarnish for the last 150 or more years. Um, so it really didn't look like a silver mounted knife. It looked much like an iron mounted knife. This knife came out of an old Rhode Island home, and with the knife was a note that said, Father's Bible and knives taken off rebel soldiers, along with a photograph of, of uh, the, the owner that we're about to discuss. I was never able to see the other knives, or the photograph, or the Bible, or any of that, but I, I, I did get this knife, and, and uh, really a, a remarkable knife. The Civil War soldier that acquired this knife a couple of decades after it was actually made was Sergeant Frederick Jones Peabody of Newport, Rhode Island. He was born on uh, January 10, 1840, and was the second son of Thomas B. and Abby Peabody. Frederick Jones Peabody was married on the 24th of June, 1860, to Annie Smith. They had one child, Tommy, who was born in 1861. Now, Tommy died on October 10, 1862, uh, as noted on the, the grave marker. Um, there are, are some complications with the history of the knife that I will explain a little bit later. Frederick Peabody uh, is buried in Newport. And uh, on his grave marker, we have a little additional information. He was sergeant of Company G, the 4th Rhode Island Volunteers, killed at the Battle of Petersburg. Uh, Frederick joined the 4th Regiment, uh, enlisted as a corporal, and his date of muster was October 30th, 1861. He enlisted in Company G of the Rhode Island 4th Infantry Regiment. He was promoted to a full sergeant and re-enlisted on January 6th, 1864. An account of this unit can be found in the book 46 Months with the 4th Rhode Island Volunteers in the War of 1861-65, comprising a history of its marches, battles, and camp life, published in 1887, and the author was Corporal George H. Allen of Company B. That book can be found on Google Books, and we will provide a link to the book on Google Books so you can check it out for yourself. The interesting part of the history of this knife, we believe, relates to a time spent at Point Lookout, Maryland uh, prison camp where the Confederate prisoners of war were held. Um, the unit arrived at Point Lookout in April of 1864 and left in July of 1864. A passage from that book. Nearly every day, large numbers of fresh fish, as we called the new arrival of prisoners, were landed here, mostly captured by the Army of the Potomac. These rebels, dressed in rags very generally, were brought here upon our transports, consorted by one or two gunboats. Details of guards attended their landing and inspected their clothes and traps, taking away only the following articles. Knives, arms, hardware of any sort, 
and money to a certain amount, all of which was accredited to them on a book kept for the purpose and returned to them at their discharge or exchange. They were then marched into the pen, served a good square meal, and assigned to good comfortable quarters. Well, maybe not all the knives were returned. Remember the note about Father's Bible and knives taken from rebel soldiers? There's a good quote about sending home souvenirs of the war by prisoners, uh, collected from prisoners, at Point Lookout in that same book. And at Point Lookout, it would be a very convenient place to collect knives and other objects, other souvenirs from the rebel soldiers who were captured, and a convenient place from which to send souvenirs home. Um, Jim Batson, in his book, James Black and His Coffin Bowie Knives, uh, says that one of Peabody's duties as sergeant was to relieve the rebel prisoners of their knives. Now, the, the other significant Civil War event relating to this knife was the Siege of Petersburg, at which Peabody was killed. Um, the most famous part of the Siege of Petersburg was, of course, the Battle of the Crater uh, on July 30th, 1864. I once owned a really nice Samuel Bell knife whose owner was wounded at the Battle of the Crater, but uh, evidently Peabody had no issues there. However, on the, uh, the day before um, Peabody was to be paroled and go home, <clears throat> he had a, a, a very bad experience and was wounded and died later that day. Uh, allow me to quote from the book again, same book. On the morning of the 30th, the lines advanced to the assault at daylight. About 130 of our men, consisting of the veterans, recruits, color guard, and a few others, followed on after our brigade down the road and formed on the left of the 7th Rhode Island. By 10 o'clock, the action became general. Our regiment, or portion of our regiment, being so few in number, was ordered to maintain a guard line in the rear of the line of battle. While at this duty, lying upon the ground near a rail fence, a battery opened upon us, sending its shot crashing into the fence, throwing the rails and splinters in every direction. One shot struck into the midst of our color guard, shattering the staff and cutting down three of its bearers, killing one and wounding the other two so badly that they soon died. Two of these men, Sergeant Peabody and Corporal Letty, were to return home the next day with the rest of the three years men, but had volunteered to carry the colors into this battle for the first for the last time. Giving me chills just reading this. After a loss of three killed and two wounded, the boys fell back a short distance out of range of that rebel battery, and there held a guard line the remainder of the day. He was killed the day before he was to go home because he wanted to be with the flag one more time. Don't stand under the flag. Bad idea. Let's get back to the note that was with this knife. I've never seen the note, but it's really intriguing note. Father's Bible carried with him during the war and knives gotten from red rebel soldiers. That's exactly what it read. Uh, a viewer suggested that Peabody might have been a mason, this knife having Masonic symbols on it, and that while he couldn't leave the knife with a rebel prisoner of war who was a, a brother mason, he may have secured it for a fellow brother and, and sent it home to deliver it later or something like that. Uh, when Peabody was killed a few months later, the possibility of returning the knife to its former owner was lost, certainly, and this is speculation, of course, but it's an interesting line of thought to consider. Uh, I, thanks to the viewer who suggested that. And we, we have this complication with Father's Bible in that the only known child of uh, Frederick Peabody uh, was Tommy, who died at the age of one. Um, now, Annie, his widow, uh, remarried to James W. Randall and had a daughter who was also named Annie, and uh, it's possible that she wrote the note thinking of uh, her mother's former husband, uh, or perhaps something else entirely. But the photograph uh, and the Bible accompanying that were apparently Frederick Peabody's. Um, now, from those of us who collect these, the, the, the big question really is, who made the knife? Um, and, and speculation is that this is a, a perhaps a James Black knife. Now, I, I don't necessarily uh, agree with that theory, but it is a theory worth exploring. And uh, let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, the, the most famous Bowie knife photograph that exists today, I think, is uh, a daguerreotype owned now by Historic Arkansas Museum and was believed taken in 1842. Uh, I won't go into detail about this daguerreotype because this would take forever, 
Um, but the book, but the daguerreotype is pictured in multiple books. Pictured in this book, it's pictured in the, in our, our catalog, uh, a Bowie knife, the sure defense in America, uh, and and many other places. And and in this daguerreotype, there are two men pictured, and one man is holding one type of guardless coffin Bowie knife, and the other man is holding another type of guardless coffin Bowie knife. And one man is believed to be James Black, and the other is believed to be Jacob Buzzard, or Bizarre. And we're not entirely sure which man is which, but it is my opinion, and the opinion of many, that one knife is of the Kerrigan knife type, and the other knife is of what we now call the heart coffin type, of which this is an example. Some other knives uh, of the Kerrigan type, like this, that are well known, include the Kerrigan knife, the Ducros knife, the Tunstall knife, and of course, Bowie number no. one, which many of you will be familiar with as a very large knife. Um, those knives are, are all in public collections, Historic Arkansas Museum, uh, or the Saunders Museum in Berryville, Arkansas. All very important, early, significant knives. And the Kerrigan knife, um, which is very much like, like this knife here, uh, the Kerrigan knife is part of the, the reason that we believe James Black made these knives because the knife has a direct connection back to Augustus Garland in the 1850s. Excuse me. We don't really know who made these knives, and they're, they're somewhat different from these knives here, and yet two of them are in the same photograph with two men who knew each other very well, uh, Buzzard and Black, and this is after Black had become blind in 1839. And it raises a lot of questions, you know. Was Black familiar with this other type of knife? Certainly so. He was in the photograph with one. Did he make the knife? Well, possibly. They're quite a bit different than this type, but we don't really know for sure. Um, did Buzzard have something to do with the production of this type of knife? Possibly. He wasn't a knife maker that we know of, but he was a, a relatively wealthy man as a, as a judge, and perhaps he arranged for their manufacture. We don't really know, but it does raise a, a lot of questions. Uh, the, the Frederick J. Peabody knife is not the knife in the daguerreotype, but it uh, is of the same type, and, and uh, we'll show some close-ups of the knife here so you can see that it has a... Um, that all of the knives of the heart coffin type have a silver wrap on the end, as do the, the uh, Kerrigan type knives, and also a silver wrap around the Ricasso. Uh, but the blades on these particular heart coffin knives are, are thicker, and they have this interesting file work uh, on the back spine, which forms a little heart design you'll be able to see uh, in the video here. And uh, that's why they're called heart coffins. Now, again, we're going to stretch into some speculation here. I, I don't I don't claim to know the history of this knife prior to the Civil War, but uh, Dr. James Batson, again, who wrote this really nice book, James Black and His Coffin Bowie Knives, uh, goes down a line of speculation as to who may have owned it. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. We can place knives of this type in Washington, Arkansas in 1842 because of the daguerreotype. Uh, the Mount Horeb Masonic Lodge Number no. 4 was established in Washington, Arkansas in 1838, uh, which was before, shortly before, Black had become blind. Um, because the Masonic symbols on the reverse side of this knife represent the plum at the bottom. The plum is the symbol of the junior warden. Dr. Batson suggests that the knife was made for the lodge's first junior warden, whose name was Abraham Block. Block was Jewish, uh, a merchant in Washington, and the wealthiest man in town. Uh, and it would take a wealthy man to purchase a knife like this then, as well as today, as well as anyone who were to make a knife like this today. It's going to be very expensive because it's very complex and it uses precious metals. Block's first daughter was Hester Block, oops, was named Hester. Hester Block, she married Dr. Benjamin Pendleton Jett on the 21st of February, 1833. They had two children, Captain Edward D. Jett and Major Benjamin P. Jett, Jr. Those were, those were their titles in the Civil War. Um, no other descendant of Abraham Block fought in the war. 
Hester and Benjamin's firstborn, Edward D. Jett, inherited the knife, according to Jim Batson, inherited the knife after Abraham's death in 1859 and carried the knife in the war. Now, there are complications in putting Edward Jett and Frederick Peabody in the same place at the same time. But there's more research to be done. Possibly the knife was obtained from Edward Jett when he was captured and it was traded or by, exchanged by other means and somehow found its way to F Frederick Peabody. Um, but we've got more work to do to establish that. A group of us are currently studying these knives using all available methods, scientific study, uh, a magnif you know, high magnification, x-rays, all kinds of things like that to learn what we can do to try to determine the history of these knives. We have some provenance with certain ones like the Kerrigan knife which leads us back uh, to the Washington, Arkansas and Hempstead County um, and this, not this knife in particular, but a uh, heart coffin type knives uh, also link back to Hempstead County uh, in the form of the TK Lundgren knife. So there's a lot going on right now. We're trying to learn what we can about these knives. Now, I did mention that this knife was purchased on eBay, and there have been several really wonderful knives purchased on eBay, but I would remiss not to point out that there are a lot of knives on eBay that are not what they seem. The possibility of finding a legitimate, early, valuable antique Bowie knife on eBay at a bargain price is pretty remote, However, eBay is overflowing with dealers that will eagerly sell you a fake Bowie knife for your real money. Trust me, eBay is no place for a newbie to be buying antique Bowie knives. You will be eaten alive by the sharks. If you are interested in antique Bowie knives and you would like to meet some friendly, like-minded enthusiasts and learn how to tell the difference between a genuine Bowie knife and a fake Bowie knife, I suggest you join the Antique Bowie Knife Association. We will post a link below uh, to the Antique Bowie Association website. And I also encourage you to watch the videos uh, on the Antique Bowie Knife channel that uh, my friend Travis, who shot the previous videos, uh, has been working on and uh, is doing some wonderful things over there. Finally, one more comment. Any collector who collects valuable objects would be wise to do what I do and keep their most valuable items in a safe deposit box at the local bank. Sure, it would be more fun to have them lying around the house, but for peace of mind, there really is no other choice. I hope you've enjoyed me blabbering on about this historic antique Bowie knife. We're going to be doing more YouTube videos on antique, vintage, handmade, and factory knives on, and on what's happening with what we think is the world's finest knife magazine. Knife Magazine. If you want to see more of these, please give us a like and a follow and come visit our website to check out the Knife Magazine news feed at knifemagazine.com. Thanks for watching!